I've always liked the words of Brigham Young when he said, I feel like shouting hallelujah all day long, and I think that I ever knew Joseph Smith more than a prophet. And there's the inspired and accurate statement of evaluation by John Taylor, which we've placed in the document covenants, in which he said, Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, has done more, save Jesus only, for the salvation of men in this world than any other man that ever lived in it. The prophet Joseph stands at the head of the dispensation of the fullness of times, the dispensation to which all other dispensations must finally be gathered in order to make the fullness of times or the fullness of dispensations, and in order to give the righteous of all ages a fullness of glory in the eternal world. When that's accomplished, and as the Lord says in section 29, the last shall be first, and the prophet Joseph Smith then will stand in proper status as he who has not only done most for the salvation of men on this earth with the exception of Christ only, but he then will stand next to Christ in the eternal worlds in relation to the Lord's work. The prophet Joseph Smith was seen and written about by many, many people. One of the most sophisticated observers was Josiah Quincy of the famous Quincy family. Josiah, as you know, later became mayor of Boston. He and Charles Francis Adams visited the prophet Joseph Smith in May of 1844, just a little over a month prior to the martyrdom. Quincy later wrote a book called uh, Figures of the Past, and the last chapter in it is called Joseph Smith at Nauvoo. It begins that chapter with these words. It is by no means improbable that some future textbook for the use of generations yet unborn will contain a question something like this. What historical American of the 19th century has exerted the most powerful influence upon the destinies of his countrymen? And it is by no means impossible that the answer to that interrogatory may be thus written, Joseph Smith the Mormon prophet. And the reply is absurd as it doubtless seems to most men now living, may be an obvious commonplace to their descendants. History deals in such surprises and paradoxes, quite as startling as this. The man who established a religion in this age of free debate, who was and is today accepted by hundreds of thousands as a direct emissary from the Most High, such a rare human being is not to be disposed of by telling his memory with unsavory epithets. Fanatic, impostor, charlatan, he may have been. But these hard names furnish no solution to the problem he presents us. Fanatics and impostors are living and dying every day, and their memory is buried with them. But the wonderful influence which this founder of a religion exerted and still exerts throws him into a relief before us not as a road to be criminated, but as a phenomenon to be explained. He goes on and talks about the prophet in the course of his uh, article. He describes him. He says, a fine-looking man is what the passerby would instinctively have murmured upon meeting this remarkable individual who has furnished, who has fashioned the mold, rather, which was to shape the feelings of so many thousands of his fellow mortals. But he says, but Joseph Smith was more than this. And then he talked about great men with whom he has rubbed shoulders, those who exude charisma, personality, character, all those things that make a human being great. He identifies, for example, a gentleman by the name of Elisha Potter of Rhode Island. And then he comments as follows. He says, of all men I have ever met, these two, Potter and the Prophet Joseph Smith seem best endowed with that kingly faculty which directs by intrinsic right the lives and the interests of other people. An old gentleman who joined the church in the early days of the church and later settled in Logan, Utah, was interviewed one day by a reporter who asked him if he knew Joseph Smith. He says, Did I know the Prophet Joseph? Well, I should think I did. I was one of his hired men for several years, and that simply means that I was a member of his family. Well, what sort of man was he anyway? asked the inquirer. 
The old veteran looked keenly at his inquired and said, He was the biggest-hearted, bravest, most whole-souled man I ever knew. That's what he was. If ever I loved a man, it was Joseph Smith. Outside of all his priestly connections, he was an admirable man, a good man. I tell you, at least that's the way I regarded him. He was a lover of a good horse, and there wasn't any better horsemen around that country. There wasn't any better horses rather around that country than old Charlie and Joe Duncan, the two animals he rode. And there wasn't many better horsemen either, either, either about uh, in parts than the prophets. Joe Duncan was a chestnut sorrel and was a beauty, but he wasn't anything as fine a horse as Charlie, a great big black fellow with a star in his forehead. The prophet's enemies used to recognize him by his horse when he had Charlie, and many a time out on the farm that star had to be painted out of his forehead in order to fool them. Joseph Smith was a good deal, had a good deal of, affect, of affection for these his horses, and we young fellows thought that they were the greatest steeds on earth. The prophet was always kind and sympathetic in his way, but he wasn't afraid to rebuke anyone, and I never knew anyone who was franker than he was. He called a spade a spade, and he was just as brave and fearless as he was outspoken. He certainly was a man of all men. Another early convert, so for the prophet. This was Patriarch Lorenzo Hatch. He gives us an interesting little insight into his nature and character. He says, I am rather proud and thankful that I knew Joseph Smith, uh, for I don't have to take any other man's testimony as to what kind of a man he was. I know that myself, and he was a fine man, too, I can tell you. He was brave, fearless, and frank. But he was kind and sympathetic also. Some people imagine that he was an ignorant man, but that is entirely wrong, for in those days one seldom met a brighter, more progressive man than the prophet. Joseph Smith was a fine-looking man, tall, athletic in build, quick, active, and about the finest figure on horseback that I ever seen. I have never met a man yet that I admired so sincerely, and I have met a few. You simply couldn't help but like him. He was so considerate, so sympathetic, and so manly. I think a gentleman by the name of Jacob Earl spoke of the Prophet Joseph Smith, what he called commanding presence, this kingly faculty that uh, Josiah Quincy mentions, and his strength of mind and of body, and above all, that superiority of soul, which was one of his distinguishing features. Lucy W. Kimball was an early convert, very intimate with the prophet. She gives this statement. She says, What kind of a person was Joseph Smith? Having been associated with him in life, I can answer, he was six feet in height, weighed about 200 pounds. His eyes were blue and tender, his hair a beautiful brown, soft and wavy. He was grandly proportioned, his carriage erect and graceful. He moved with an air of dignity peculiar to himself. He was thirty-eight and a half years old uh, when martyred. Naturally, he was a courteous, kind, and obliging, frank to all men, both friends and foes. He was remarkably cheerful for one who had seen well-tried friends martyred around him and felt the inflictions of calumny, the vexations of lawsuits, the treachery of intimates, and uh, multiplied attempts on his person and life together with the cares of much business. Still, his influence among his friends was very great, and they were as ardently attached to him as his enemies were violently opposed to him. Free toleration was given to all opposing religions, and yet persecution followed him. Very many of the world looked upon the prophet as a marvel, confessed the mystery of his power and the unaccountability of his grandeur. The prophet lived an humble and upright life. The world knew him not. He sought only the salvation of the human family. When asked by strangers how it was that he held such power over the people, he replied that he taught them correct principles and they governed themselves. Peter Burnett was the first governor of the state of California. Prior to that, he lived in Missouri and was there at the time of the Missouri difficulties, 
And being a legal man, a legal profession, he acted as one of the Prophet Joseph Smith's lawyers in the difficulties then that were related to the expulsion of the Latter-day Saints from the state of Missouri. Later, Burnett wrote about the Prophet Joseph Smith and described him and his experiences with him. He said, Joseph Smith was a most extraordinary man. I was his lawyer in 1838 and 39. I studied him as a man, not his religion, and knew him as a man. Joseph Smith was at least six foot tall and weighed 180 pounds or more. I think Emma's good cooking got the best of his midriff when he get into the Nauvoo period. He says, uh, he certainly was no ordinary man. He possessed the most indomitable perseverance and was a good judge of men. He deemed himself born to command, and he did command. His views were strange and striking, and his manner earnest. One could not but be interested. There was a kind, familiar look about him which pleased. He was courteous in discussion and would not oppose an opponent abruptly, but had due deference for the feelings of others. His views and illustrations were his own. He had great influence on others. When he talked about the prophet being taken uh, prisoner there at Far West, and he was confined in uh, a place that uh, General Donovan called the bullpen, where they put the Mormon prisoners, and treated very harshly. But uh, the prophet, with the magnetic personality he had, uh, brings this statement from, from Peter Burnett. He says, after a short period of five days, Joseph had managed to mollify his enemies to the extent that he could move about unprotected without danger. He was a strong, athletic man and was known to have been a wrestler. The guards proposed that he wrestle one of their men. Smith courteously refused on the grounds that he was now a minister of the gospel. The men assured the prophet that there would be no betting or gambling. He would all be in fun. So the prophet then consented. He says they selected the best man among them, their number, and Joseph Smith threw him many times in succession, much to the amusement of the, of the spectators. He says that Joseph Smith was an eloquent speaker and made a fine appearance. He says Sidney Rigdon did not possess the native intellect of Joseph, and he lacked Joseph Smith's determination and will. The prophet was a, a unique person. He was a man among men, a United States artillery officer. Stoker means follows. He says, Joseph is a noble looking fellow, a Mohammed, every inch of him. Who will not say that the Mormon prophet is not among the great spirits of the age? The New York, the New York Herald, in an article on Mormonism in the Prophet's Day, uh, expressed it this way. He says, Joseph Smith, the president of the church, prophet, seer, and revelator, is 36 years of age, six foot high in pumps, weighing 212 pounds. He is a man of the highest order of talent and great independence of character, firm in his integrity, and devoted to his religion. As a public speaker, he is bold, powerful, and convincing. As a leader, wise and prudent, yet fearless as a military commander, brave and determined as a citizen, affable and kind, bland in his manners, and of noble bearing. Probably Parnas E. Pratt, who lived with him traveled with him and one of this was one of the first members of the Quorum of the Twelve, gives us as accurate a pen picture of the prophet as we have. Elder Pratt follows. President Joseph Smith was in person tall and well built, strong and athletic, of a light complexion, light hair, blue eyes, very little beard, and of an expression peculiar to himself on which the eye naturally rested with interest and was never weary of beholding. His countenance was ever mild, affable, beaming with intelligence and benevolence, mingled with a look of interest and an unconscious smile or cheerfulness, and entirely free from all restraint or affection of gravity. And there was something connected with the clear and steady penetrating glance of his eye as if he would penetrate the deepest abyss of the human heart gaze into eternity, penetrate the heavens, and comprehend all worlds. He possessed a noble boldness and independence of character. His manner was easy and familiar, his rebuke terrible as the lion, 
His benevolence unbounded is the ocean. His intelligence universal, his language abounding in original eloquence, peculiar to himself, not polished, not studied, not smoothed and softened by education and refined by art, but flowing forth in his own native simplicity and profusely abounding in variety of subject and manner. He interested and edified, while at the same time he amused and entertained his audience, and none listened to him who were ever weary with his discourse. I have even known him to retain a congregation of willing and anxious listeners for many hours together in the midst of cold or sunshine, rain or wind, while they were laughing at one moment and weeping the next. Even his most bitter enemies were generally overcome if he could once get their ears. In short, in him was the character of a Daniel and a Cyrus. Things were wonderfully, blend, wonderfully blended. The gifts, wisdom, and devotion of Daniel were united with the boldness, courage, temperance, perseverance, and generosity of Osiris. And had he been spared a martyr's state till mature manhood and age, he was certainly endowed with powers and ability to have revolutionized the world in many respects and to have transmitted to posterity a name associated with more brilliant and glorious acts than has yet fallen to the lot of mortals. Now, that kind of observation comes not only from friends but from foes. One person in meeting the prophet records this statement. My impression on beholding the prophet and shaking hands with him was that I stood face to face with the greatest man on earth. Another, when I first saw him, I believed he was one of God's noblemen. And as I grew older, I became thoroughly convinced that he was a true prophet of God. Wilford Woodruff put it this way. He says, in his public and private career, he carried with him the spirit of the Almighty. And he manifested a greatness of soul, which I have never seen in any other man. Another person, I, kn I knew him as soon as I saw him. Although I was young, I knew that he was a man of God. General Moses Wilson was one of the most bitter anti-Mormons, Mormon haters as they called them in that day in Missouri, when the prophet was taken captive. In Missouri, for a time, he was in the custody of Moses Wilson, and Moses Wilson has this to say about him. He says, he was a very remarkable man. I carried him into my house, a prisoner in chains, and in less than two hours, my wife loved him better than she did me. Well, that's the prophet, the kind of a person then who blends personality, charisma, and intellect with great, profound spiritual capabilities. All of these rolled up in one magnificent bundle, if I can put it that way. Probably one of his most distinctive features was just the gaze of his eyes. We have accounts where that fact is brought out on more than one occasion. One person put it this way, that his handsome blue eyes, he says, would seem to dive down to the inmost thoughts with their sharp, penetrating gaze. So I felt when he was present that he could read me through and through. He was very companionable, just uh, the ideal kind of individual. In the fall of 1842, because his enemies were after him, the Missouri enemies and mob and so forth coming over into Illinois, the prophet felt that it was appropriate to just retire from public life. And so he went out into an area on the outskirts of Nauvoo, where the father of John Taylor lived. And he would sleep in the Taylor home, have breakfast in the morning, and then he and John Taylor's younger brother, William Taylor, would knock around out in the brush and keep out of the way during the day. And then in the evening, they would come back, have the evening meal, sit around and talk about the things of the kingdom and retire and repeat the performance the next day. William Taylor makes this report of that rather interesting and intimate association that he had. He says, It is impossible for me to express my feelings in regard to this period of my life. I have never known the same joy and satisfaction in the companionship of any other person, man or woman, than I felt with him, the man who had conversed with the Almighty. He was always the most companionable and lovable of men, cheerful and jovial. Much has been said about his geniality and personal magnetism, because I was a witness to this. People, old and young, loved him and trusted him 
instinctively. And Lyon B. Wells, where he became famous as a Mormon writer and president of the Relief Society in the Salt Lake area. But she was a, a convert in the Nauvoo period, became well acquainted with the prophet Joseph Smith, makes this statement concerning him. She says, I heard him preach all of his last sermons, and frequently met him, and shook hands with him, and always felt in my inmost soul he was indeed a man unlike all others. He possessed the innate refinement that one finds in the born poet. Now, it wasn't just a man of physical power, but he had sensitivity and refinement of character. He possessed the, the innate refinement that one finds in the, in the born poet, or in the most highly cultivated intellectual and poetic nature. He was beyond my comprehension. The power of God rested upon him to such a degree that on many occasions he seemed transfigured. His expression was mild and almost childlike in repose, and when addressing the people who loved him it seemed to adoration the glory of his countenance was beyond description. At other times the great power of his manner, more than his voice, which was sublimely eloquent to me, seemed to shake the place on which we stood and penetrate the inmost heart of the hearers, and I am sure that then they would have laid down their lives to defend him. I always listened spellbound to his every utterance, the chosen of God in this last dispensation. Now, the prophet was an active man, and he, he loved sports. And as you read through the journals of the day and his own journal, then you find repeated reference to his engaging in various physical kinds of activity. And he used to go out of his way to do it. He, he loved to wrestle. He loved to pull sticks. He loved to jump at the mark. He, he loved to play ball. And he loved the physical kinds of things. And this apparently then was characteristic of him even as a young person. Prior to the time the prophet got the plate, from which the Book of Mormon was translated, after the angel Moroni came and before he got the plate, that interim period between 1823 and, and 1827, he worked part-time, at least, down in the southern part of the state of, of New York for a gentleman by the name of Joseph Knight. Uh, Knight had uh, quite a lot of land, hired uh, young men to work for him, and he had a couple of boys. One of them was called Joseph Jr., and the other was called Newell, Newell K. Knight. Joseph Jr. makes this comment, speaking of the prophet. He says his noble deportment, his faithfulness, and his kind address could not fail to win the esteem of those who had the pleasure of his acquaintance. One thing that I will mention, which seemed to be pecu a peculiar characteristic with him in all of his boys' sports and amusements, I never knew anyone to gain advantage over him, and yet he was always kind and kept the goodwill of his playmates. Thus, have you, you find repeated reference, then, to the prophet's physical activities. One person described him as being quick as a squirrel, Strong as a lion, but as gentle as a lamb. Major Joseph McGee of Gallatin, Missouri, reported, says, I saw Joseph Smith throw John Brassfield, the champion wrestler of the county, the first two falls out of a match of three. He was a powerful man. Another acquaintance of the prophet put it this way, says, I have seen the prophet wrestle and run and jump, but have never seen him beaten. In all that he did, he was manly and almost godlike. On one occasion, the prophet was out taking up a collection for his good friend Oren Porter Rockwell. Rockwell was in the hands of the Missourians, and Missouri law in those days wasn't worth very much, particularly with the hatred of the Missourians against the Latter-day Saints. And they had sent word that if the prophet would raise a certain amount of money, they would free Porter, who was one of the prophet's close and bosom friends, and allow him to come home. And so the prophet was out taking up a collection. As he wandered around and went around the streets, he found on a vacant lot there in, in Nauvoo a group of young Mormon boys engaging in the frontier activities and sports of the time, pulling sticks and wrestling. And among them was a great big booster of a fellow from the neighboring town of Laharf, Illinois. And he had pretty well uh, showed his mastery over all the Mormon boys in the area. And as the prophet came up to make his wishes known, 
big fellow figured he'd put the final feather in his cap, and so he challenged Joseph Smith to a wrestle. Well, the prophet uh, took up the collection and then says, okay, and so they squared off. And this fellow made a pass at him, which was his last. The prophet stepped nimbly to the side, grabbed him by the nab of the neck and the seat of the bitches, and hoisted him bodily over top of his head, walked a short distance, and dropped him in a ditch of water right on his back. And when the fellow came up bubbling, spouting, the prophet reached out his hand with a big broad grin on his face, pulled him out, slapped him on the back, said, Now you mustn't mind this when I'm with the boys who like to make all the fun for them that I can. Now that's the kind of person that he was. He loved social things. As Benjamin F. Johnson, who became a close and intimate friend to him, said, When with us there was no lack of amusement, for with jokes, games, etc., he was always ready to provoke merriment, one phase, one phase of which was matching couplets in rhyme. But the prophet was a man of, of extreme integrity. He just had a quality of integrity that you seldom see in a person. This quality within him brought him to the point where, in his feelings and thinking, he simply did everything that a human being ought to do. And he treated other people completely and fully as he would want them to treat him. And he did his share of work around so that it wasn't a matter of saying, well, I'm the prophet of the Lord, and I've got to go talk to the Lord, and you guys do the work. For example, as they were traveling on Zion's camp, that body of men of a couple hundred men who had left Kirtland and marched for a thousand miles or so down to Jackson County in an effort to reinstate the Latter-day Saints on their lands, having been driven out of Jackson County by the mob, as they were going along in a frontier situation, few of any roads, in the spring of the year with mud sometimes axial deep, this situation then certainly reduced people down to basic integrity. And we have this statement made out of the prophet. It says, Zion's camp in passing through the state of Indiana had to cross very bad swamps. Consequently, we had to attach ropes to the wagons to help them through, and the prophet was the first man at the rope in his bare feet. He says this was characteristic of him. Now, the prophet had a childlike simplicity, and he loved children. When a group of Latter-day Saints would come into Kirtland, converts from some area, the prophet would go meet them after shaking hands with the uh, the men and saying howdy to the ladies, he'd go play his kids. And he was just that kind of a person. One reporter made this statement of him. Joseph was noted for his childlike love and familiarity with children, and he never seemed to feel that he was losing any of his honor or dignity in doing so. And if he heard a child cry, he would rush out of the house to see if it was harmed. Another statement. He was a great favorite among the children. I have uh, known him many times to stop as he passed the playgrounds when we were out of school and shake hands with the girls and play ball with the boys and marbles with the boys. Another statement. One marked illustration of his character was his love for children. He never saw a child, but he desired to take it up and bless it. And many he did so bless, taking them in his arms and upon his knee. I have myself sat upon his knees. He was so fond of children that he would go far out of his way to speak to a little one, which is to me a striking characteristic of true manhood. He had a true love for the human race. And then here finally it was the disposition of the prophet Joseph when he saw little children in the mud to take them up in his arms and wash the mud from their bare feet and from their, uh, with his handkerchief and oh how kind he was to the old folks as well as to the little children. He always had a smile for his friends and was always cheerful. Now, that's the kind of person he was in the sense of basic endowments. Now, let's shift gears and talk about another aspect of the prophet's life. He was raised on frontier or semi-frontier conditions. When his mother, Lucy Mack, brought the family, Joseph Smith Sr. having preceded them, to Palmyra, she had about two cents left after making the journey from New England down to New York. They homesteaded 
some land there just thickly covered with trees. Now, you know you don't grow very much wheat when you've got trees so thick that you can hardly see the sunshine. And so they exerted every effort, first of all, to clear the land, and then to work on the side to just get the basic necessities of life. And as a result of this kind of life in his early days, the prophet had very, very little opportunity, if any, to get an education. Martin Harris said that when he began to translate the Book of Mormon, he couldn't spell the word February without using the German summons. Emma Smith said that he couldn't dictate a coherent letter. And yet she said that over and over again she saw him then as he dictated in a period of 75 working days or thereabouts this sacred volume we call the Book of Mormon. And as she would call dinner and he and his scribe then would cease, they might just stop right in the middle of a sentence. And when the prophet came back and picked up the Yerman Thummim, he didn't say, Now, Oliver, read me back the last paragraph and let's see where we're going. He just took the Yerman Thummim, looked in it, dictated the next word, and rolled it right on through just like there had been no break. Now, I've written all 15, 20 books, and you just can't do that kind of thing. It just can't be done unless you want to have some kind of a wandering, meandering document. You can't do that and get the kind of document that you have in the Book of Mormon. George A. Smith, the prophet's cousin, called him a plowboy, one who cultivated the earth, he said, and had scarcely education enough to read his Bible. Orson Pratt, who was a early convert when he was in from his missions, at times stayed with the prophet in his home, explained the basic educational capabilities of the prophet in these words. He says he could read without much difficulty and write a very imperfect hand and had a very limited understanding of the elementary rules of arithmetic. These were his highest and only attainments. Now, when the prophet began the translation of the Book of Mormon, then it was under these circumstances. Now, that doesn't mean that he stayed that way. The prophet got up early in the morning, day after day, week after week, and studied grammar, and he studied German, and he studied Hebrew, and he became a very learned and a polished individual. He was a person who had a native intellect that I personally don't believe we have seen equaled in the Church since his day. I was talking one time in the historian's office with Preston Nibley, who has written, I guess, 20 or 30 books on Mormon subjects, including a biography of the Prophet. So, you know, when I wrote my book on Brigham Young, and he wrote another big husky one on, on President Young, he said, I got so familiar with him that I could start reading a, the report of a sermon, and I could tell you how he was going to end it. He said, but I never could do that with Joseph Smith. And then he observed, he says, uh, in my personal feelings, he says, I think Brigham Young was our second greatest president. To me, I don't think he came up to the top of the prophet's shoes. He says, what do you think, Brother Andrus? I said, well, I hate to disagree with you, Brother Midley. And that kind of took him back. He said, well, what do you think? I said, I don't think he came up to the top of the prophet's souls. Now, maybe he was more accurate than I was. But the prophet had a tremendous native intellect. And he had an insatiable thirst for knowledge. Now, maybe some of you sophisticated folks won't know exactly what this simile means when someone said to Joe that he was the calf that sucked three cows. He just couldn't get enough. He was that kind of a person. But when he began the translation of the Book of Mormon, he did it under extremely humble circumstances. He began with a friend and neighbor not too far distant from where he lived by the name of Martin Harris, who in that day was a, a well-to-do farmer. And uh, the Lord instructed the prophet to invite Martin to come over and help him translate the Book of Mormon. So the prophet sent word over to Martin, come on over to our place and this evening and let's talk about it. And so Martin made his way on over there to the Smith home. And they talked about the things. Joseph told him the story, and Martin didn't know whether he wanted to believe it or not. Uh, at that time, the prophet had the plates in his possession, but as you know, he wasn't permitted to allow anyone to see the record itself. But he had them in an old Ontario glass box, 
And he allowed Martin Harris to pick up the glass box and to shake it, you know, and rattle it. And he could hear the metallic uh, plates in there rattling. And after the visit then, Martin went on his way home, pondering what he had been told and what he had experienced. And in his mind, this is the way he evaluated it. He says, I knew that the Smith family didn't have enough money to buy that much gold. And I knew that the contents either had to be gold or lead. And I knew also that they didn't have enough money to buy that much lead. So I just had to conclude then that the prophet had found gold plates because there was something metallic in there that weighed heavy enough to be gold or lead. And they just didn't have enough money to buy that much lead. And when the prophet then went with Martin down to Harmony, Pennsylvania, where they began to translate, and then Martin lost the first unit of the abridgment of, of Mormon called the Book of Lehi, the 116 pages, and Oliver Cowdery then came to work with him in the spring of 1829. By that time, the, the prophet was basically destitute of any sustenance. He had made friends with the Knight family, as I indicated, for whom he worked, Joseph Knight, and apparently Joseph Knight knew that he was over there working on the Book of Mormon. So one day he took his wagon and loaded it full of provisions and headed out for Harmony. When he got there, he couldn't find the prophet. The prophet and all of her out trying to find work because they were just that desperate. And he finally found them and supplied their physical needs. And then he found that he didn't have any paper on which to write the translation. And they didn't have any money to buy any paper. And so Joseph Knight then goes into town and buys a whole bunch of fool's cap paper. He indicates that under those circumstances, the prophet then begins the translation. Now, his father-in-law, that is the prophet's father-in-law, lived just across the street from the, where, prophet, where Joseph and Emma lived. And uh, Isaac Hale was a great hunter and a great trapper, and he had in the backyard an old hide house. It was an old shack that he had rigged up with means to hang the hides on. When he skinned the skunk, why, he hung it up out there. Now, or a muskrat or a beaver or something like this, so he hung it up there. Now, the prophet then began the translation of the Book of Mormon out there in Isaac Hale's old hide house, writing the manuscript on paper that Joseph Knight provided and letting on the food that Joseph Knight provided and not able to spell the word February without using the Urban thumb. Now, those were the circumstances now out of which the gospel came in this day. Yet the prophet then was a tremendous native ability, with a tremendous intellect, a tremendous capacity of mind, the kind of faith where he could stand on earth in mortality and his head be above the veil, where he could penetrate the heavens and where he received ministrations from angelic beings far more than we realize, then under those circumstances this great work came forth. For this reason, then, you have some of his later associates talk about the contrast in his life. John Taylor, for example, put it this way. He says, I can tell you what he told me. He said that he was very ignorant of the ways, designs, and purposes of God and knew nothing about them. He was a youth at the time of his vision, unacquainted with religious matters or systems or theories of the day. He was ignorant of letters as the world has it but the most profoundly learned and intelligent man in afterlife that I have ever met in my life. And I have traveled hundreds of thousands of miles, been on different continents, and mingled with all classes and creeds of people. Yet I have never met a man so intelligent as Joseph Smith. In my opinion, President Brigham Young was the Prophet Joseph Smith's most ardent and devoted disciple. President Young spoke of contemporary sectarians as being as blind, he said, as Egyptian darkness, without correct information about heaven, hell, God, angels, or devils. But, said he, when I saw Joseph Smith, he took heaven, figuratively speaking, and brought it down to earth. And he took the earth, brought it up, and opened up in plainness and simplicity the things of God. And that is the beauty of his mission. Then on another occasion, he expressed it this way. He says, it was my ex in my experience, I never did let an opportunity pass of getting with the prophet Joseph 
and of hearing him speak in public or in private, so that I might draw understanding from the fountain from which he spoke. In the days of the prophet Joseph, such moments were more precious to me than all the wealth of the world. No matter how great my poverty, if I had to borrow meal to feed my wife and children, I never had an opportunity to pass of learning what the prophet had to impart. And then he confesses, this now is the secret of your humble servant Brigham. This is where he got his, his insight and his understanding. Now, where then did the prophet get his? How was he taught? Now, I got four college degrees, including a Ph.D., and I'd trade all of mine without even blinking an eye for just one half of what Joseph Smith had and what he got in the way of education. It began with that great theophany we call the first vision in the spring of 1820. When he came out of the sacred grove, he knew more about God and about the nature of God than the whole Christian world combined. The real education that was given to the prophet began with the angel Moroni. And this was a kind of an ideal kind of education, where you've got two people sitting on the log, an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball instruction between them. When the prophet came in contact with Moroni, he had a kind of experience that many Latter-day Saints really haven't comprehended. I'd like to, in some measure, get into that tonight. Oliver Cowdery wrote a series of letters concerning the Moroni experiences, including the initial coming of the angel Moroni. And let me just quote from, from this. It was published in the early days of the church in what we call the Messenger Advocate, one of the church papers back in Kirtland. He's talking about the prophet then retiring to bed in the evening of September 1823 and beginning then to pray to the Lord to determine what his condition and situation was before God. And he says, In this situation, hours passed unnumbered. How many or how few I know not. Neither is he able to inform me. But suppose that uh, it must have been 11 or 12, and perhaps uh, later, as the noise and bustle of the family in retiring had long since ceased. While continuing in prayer for a manifestation in some way that his sins were forgiven, endeavoring to exercise faith in the scriptures, on a sudden, a light like that of day, only of a pure and far more glorious appearance and brightness, burst into the room. Indeed, to use his own description, the first sight was as though the house was filled with consuming and unquenchable fire. This sudden appearance of a light so bright as must naturally be expected, occasioned a shock or sensation visible to the extremities of the body. It was, however, followed with a calmness and a serenity of mind, and an overwhelming rapture of joy that surpassed understanding, and in a moment a person had stood before him. Notwithstanding the room was previously filled with light about the brightness of the sun, or above the brightness of the sun, as I have before described, yet, he says, there seemed to be an additional glory surrounding or accompanying this personage, which shone with increased degree of brilliancy, of which he was in the midst. And though his countenance was as lightning, yet it was of a pleasing, innocent, and glorious appearance, so much so that every fear was banished from the heart, and nothing but calmness pervaded the soul. Now, Moroni began to quote biblical prophecies. In the official statement that we have in the Pro Great Price, you have some of the scriptural references identified by the prophet, which Moroni quoted. But if you go to Oliver Cowdery's account, he gives you literally many times more and begins his description by saying, now I might not get the words exactly that the angel repeated, but I'll give you the substance and the scriptural references. And then he goes on page after page after page. And when he gets through then, he says again now, I may not have followed the exact words, but I have given you a true account of the substance. So that Moroni then spent considerable time explaining biblical scriptures to the prophet. But this isn't all. In addition to this, Moroni used divine means of instruction. You remember, for example, when the prophets reported that Moroni had told him about the golden plates on the hill Cumorah, that he says, as he was speaking concerning this 
repository there on yonder hill. He says, The vision was opened so that I could see, and this so clearly that when I went there the next day, I had no difficulty finding the place. Now, it's this visual kind of instruction. For example, Oliver Cowdery gives us this statement of the way by which Joseph Smith was taught. He says, When God manifests to his servants those things that are to come, or those which have been, he does it by unfolding them by the power of that Spirit which comprehends all things always. And so much may be shown and made perfectly uh, plain to the understanding in a short time that the world who are occupied all their life to learn a little look at the relation of it and are disposed to call it false. Now note, he says, You will understand then by this that while those glorious things were being rehearsed, the vision was also opened so that our brother was permitted to see and understand much more fully and perfectly that I am able to communicate to you in writing. Now, for example, Moroni told him about the ancient inhabitants on this continent, but he didn't just tell them, he showed them to him. In the Wentworth letter, from which we get the Articles of Faith, the prophet wrote as follows. He says, I was informed concerning the aboriginal inhabitants of this country and shown who they were, and from whence they came, a brief sketch of their origin, progress, civilization, laws, governments, of their righteousness and iniquity, and the blessings of God being withdrawn from them as a people was made known unto me. Now, he, he had the Book of Mormon down cold before he got the place out of the hill. He had seen the Lehi colony. He had seen their coming to this land. He had seen the whole history clear down to the winding up thing. And all of this then, through visual means, there in September 1823. Now imagine, for example, having that kind of understanding what the Smith family home evenings would be like after that. Mother Smith tells us a little about them, and they did have them. She says, during our evening conversations, and she's talking now about 1823 and 4 in that period of time, Joseph would occasionally give us some of the most amusing recitals that you could imagine. He would describe the ancient inhabitants of this continent their dress, mode of traveling, and the animals on which they rode, their cities, their buildings, with every particular, their mode of warfare, and also their religious worship. This he would do with as much ease, seemingly, as if he had spent his whole life among them. In another statement, Mother Smith says, this, During the day, she says, our sons would endeavor to get through their work as early as possible, and say, Mother, have supper early so we can have a long evening to listen to Joseph. Sometimes Joseph would describe the appearance of the Nephites, their mode of dress and warfare, their implements of husbandry, and many things he had seen in vision. Now, Oliver Cowdery gives us two examples scripturally of the way by which Joseph Smith was taught. One of them is in the Book of Ether. You know, Mark Twain said he once read the Book of Mormon. And he called it chloroform in print. And he must have started to deal with the Book of Ether, in my opinion. But here in the Book of Ether, you do have, seriously now, you do have the account of the brother of Jared and the great uh, vision that was shown to him. And here in Ether chapter 3, and this is, this is a reference that Oliver Cowdery gives as an example of how Joseph Smith was taught. Verse 25, when the Lord had said these words, he showed unto the brother of Jared all the inhabitants of the earth, which had been, and also all that would be. And he withheld them not from his sight even to the ends of the earth. Now, in a similar way, Joseph Smith was taught. Uh, Oliver Cowder gives another reference, and this is over in the book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Christ, chapter 1, where when Moses was talking with the Lord, the record says that he cast his eyes and beheld the earth, yea, even all of it. And there was not a particle of it which he did not behold, discerning it by the Spirit of God. And he beheld also the inhabitants thereof, and there was not a soul which he beheld not. And he discerned them by the Spirit of God, and their numbers were great, even numberless as the sands of the sea. Now Moroni used the same divine means to teach Joseph Smith. He showed him the Lehi colony. He unfolded the scriptures and taught them to him, not merely by verbal means but by the intelligent powers of the Spirit and by visual means and processes. So that when the prophet comes out of that experience, then he's, he's got an education.
uh, based on what I would call celestial audiovisual techniques. Now, as the prophet went to the hill Cumorah the next day, then he was taught further things, this time now the vision opening in two different ways. One, he sees into the spirit world, and he sees the forces of, ad- of the adversary. As he went to the hill Cumorah, he had dollar signs in his eyes. I mean, he was tempted because of the monetary value of those records. If you haven't got enough money to, to buy a pound of lead, uh, you might uh, think twice if the angel tells you there's, there's gold in those hills. And so as he went to the hill Cumorah, then, he was caught up with the fact that these plates were made of gold. And he had dollar signs in his eyes, and when he got up on the hill Cumorah, then he immediately found the place, got himself a, a stick, and pried off the top stone to the sacred repository. And he began then to reach down to lift out the plates. As he did, a very severe and powerful shock came on him, his body, and he just couldn't reach his hand any further, and it was threw him back, and he looked at the thing, and there they were, and he made another effort at it, and he was a husky fellow, and so he tried it again, and this time, then another powerful shock, and so he made a third effort, and this time he ended up on his back, down the hill a ways, and he made the comment, why can't I get these things? What's the matter? The messenger then said, because you haven't get the commandments. And he explained to him that strict requirements were necessary and that as a result of not keeping those strict requirements, then he was not permitted to take the place at the time. But with this then, and here's how Oliver Cowdery explains it, he says, at that instant, he looked to the Lord in prayer. And as he prayed, darkness began to disperse from his mind and his soul was lit up as in the evening before. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And again did the Lord manifest his uh, condescension and mercy. The heavens were opened, and the glory of the Lord shone round about and rested upon him. While thus he stood gazing and admiring, the angel said, Look. And as he thus uh, spake, he beheld the prince of darkness, surrounded by his innumerable train of associates. All this passed before him, and the heavenly messenger said, All this is shown, the good and the evil, the holy and the impure, the glory of God and the power of darkness, that you may know the difference, know how to differentiate hereafter the two powers, and never be influenced or overcome by the wicked one. Behold, whatsoever entices or leads to do good, then this comes from God, and whatsoever does not comes from the wicked one. And he says, then it it is he that fills the hearts of men with evil to walk in darkness and blasphemy God. And you may learn from henceforth that his ways are to destruction, but his way of holiness is peace and rest. Then the prophet was given a vision of the future, including the restoration of the gospel, the restoration of the holy priesthood, and things that go on down even future to our day, and that we haven't yet seen fulfilled. As the prophet saw this vision of the powers of darkness and the glory of God, then he was told concerning this ancient record. And he says, On it is contained the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ as it was given to the Lord's people in this land. And when it should be brought forth by the power of God, it should be carried to the Gentiles, of whom many will receive it. And after will the seed of Israel be brought into the fold. And then he goes on and explains that When this comes forth, then he says, persecution will increase, and those that are not built upon the rock will seek to overthrow you and seek your life. He says, when they are interpreted, though the Lord will give the holy priesthood to some, and they shall begin to proclaim this gospel and baptize by water, and after that they have power, after they shall have power to give the Holy Ghost by the laying on of their hands. Then will persecution rage more and more, for the iniquities of men shall be revealed, and those who are not built upon the rock will seek to over- the overthrow of this church. But it will increase the more opposed, and spread farther and farther, increasing in knowledge, till they shall be sanctified, and note this, and receive an inheritance where the glory of God shall rest upon them. Now we're talking about getting back to Jackson County, building Zion where the spiritual endowment that will be given because we finally build Zion and do the things that we should, 
The spiritual endowment will be such that the Lord will create upon every dwelling place in Mount Zion and upon all of her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the flaming of the fire, a flame of fire by night. That kind of spiritual endowment. So he says now this, this work will continue until finally the saints receive an inheritance where the glory of the Lord shall rest upon them. And he says when this takes place, when you get to that point, and all things are prepared, the ten tribes of Israel will be revealed in the north country. Now, when do the ten tribes come in? Some people think we're already gathering them. Well, we're gathering Israel, that's true, because Israel's not only in a body, but they're also dispersed throughout the world. But there is a body to that group of people Then Jesus went and ministered after visiting the Nephites. And they're to return, and he indicates their return is after them the saints have been sanctified and receive an inheritance where the glory of the Lord rests upon them. Then he goes on to say, and when this is fulfilled, that is, when the ten tribes come, he says, then will be brought to pass that staying of the prophet. And he quotes Isaiah 59 and 20, and the Redeemer should come to Zion unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. A lot of us are looking for the second coming. We talk about it once in a while. And we usually have reference to that great world appearance where Christ comes in glory in the clouds of heaven, and every eye sees him, and the wicked are consumed, and the righteous are caught up to meet him, and, and his kingdom then is made universal. But what we sometimes fail to understand is that Christ will appear among the righteous of his people and live among them for a matter of years before he comes in glory. And this will take place. This appearance of Christ, as Moroni explained it, will take place after two prior events. Number one, after the saints have finally lured the gospel to the point that they receive an inheritance where the glory of the Lord rests upon them, and then after the ten tribes come from the north countries, then, he says, after those two things, the words of Isaiah will be fulfilled, who writes then that the Redeemer should come to Zion and to those that turn from ungodliness in Jacob. Now, as the prophet then is instructed concerning these things, then he's shown that this work to come forth is designed to bring about uh, marvelous transformations, not only in individual lives and not only in this land, but ultimately throughout the world. The prophet Jonah put it this way. He says, I intend to lay a foundation that will revolutionize the world. And he goes on to say that it will not be by sword or gun that this will be accomplished, but the power of truth is such that it will ultimately be done. But as Moroni, for example, discussed with the prophet Joseph Smith these events, he says this, Therefore, says the Lord, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. The wisdom of their wise shall perish, and the understanding of their prudence shall be hid. For according to his covenant, which he made with his ancient saints, his people, the house of Israel, must come to a knowledge of the gospel and win that Messiah whom their fathers rejected, and with them the fullness of the gospel be gathered in to rejoice in one fold and, and the one shepherd. He says, Now this cannot be brought to pass, this marvelous work and wonder cannot be brought to pass until first certain preparatory things are accomplished. For so has the Lord proposed in his own mind. He has therefore chosen you as an instrument, speaking to Joseph, in his hands, to bring to light that through which shall perform his act, his strange act, and bring to pass a marvelous work and a wonder. Now, the Book of Mormon, to me, is, is the greatest miracle of modern times. To think that the prophet whipped that off in 75 working days, and to really get into it and understand what it says. It contains a key not only of the knowledge of the gospel, but of our day that's superior to anything that you can find anywhere else. And it's prophetic in the nth degree. If you want to know more about what's going to happen in the 1990s, the best source to go to is the Book of Mormon, if you read it and read it the way it's intended that you understand it. All right, but sometimes we call the Book of Mormon the marvelous work and a wonder. But that's not so. The Book of Mormon was a preparatory action to the marvelous work. The marvelous work and a wonder is the establishment of the Lord's kingdom, the gathering of Israel, the whole new order of society and of government that will bring peace and righteousness and renovate the earth and renew the earth to a paradisical state of glory. That's the marvelous work and a wonder. 
And in that marvelous work, then, the wisdom of the wise will perish, and the understanding of the prudent will be hid. Now, uh, it's that kind of work, then, that the Lord initiated through this young man, the prophet Joseph Smith. And in connection with that, then, it wasn't just a matter of Moroni appearing on the scene. Besides Moroni in those early days, there were other Nephite prophets. For example, in the Wentworth letter, and I'm talking about 1823 to 1827, that period of time, in the Wentworth letter, the prophet Joseph Smith writes as follows. He says, after having received many visits from the angels of God, and the word is plural, angels, not just Moroni, unfolding the majesty and glory of the events that should transpire in the last days, on the morning of September A.D. 1827, the angel of the Lord delivered the records into my hand. Now, he had had angels, many angels, prior then to getting the plates. We usually say, well, Moroni, John the Baptist, Peter, James, and John, but you see what we've left out with that kind of, of a statement. Here's John Taylor. He says, when Joseph Smith was raised up as a prophet of God, Mormon, Moroni, Nephi, and others of the ancient prophets who formerly lived on this continent, and Peter and John, and others who lived on the Asiatic continent, came to him. Here's George Q. Clemming, who was one of the great minds of the church and a counselor in the First Presidency for more than one prophet. He says, if you will read the history of the church from the beginning, you will find that uh, Joseph was visited by various angelic beings, but not one of them professed to give him the keys until John the Baptist came to him. Moroni, who held the keys of the record of the stick of Ephraim, visited Joseph. He had doubtless also visits from Nephi, and it may have been from, from Alma and others. But though they came and had authority, holding the authority of the priesthood, we have no account of their ordaining him. And that's what I'm trying to say, is that the prophet has a familiarity with the ancient personalities of the past. Uh, William Taylor, who was with him those days and who was keeping out of the sight of the Missourians who were after him, has this to say about him as he evaluates Joseph. He says, he seemed to be just as familiar with the spirit world and as well acquainted with the other side as he was here. If you read, for example, section 128 of the Doctrine and Covenants, about verse 20 and 21, you'll find that the prophet delineates many of the major events in the ushering in of this dispensation. And he begins with the coming of Moroni, then he talks about uh, other events that happened. Michael, who was Adam, appearing on the banks of the Susquehanna River, and then he talks about Peter, James, and John, and then in verse 21 he says this, and again the voice of God in the chamber of Old Father Whitmer in Fayette, Seneca County, and at sundry times and in divers places through all the travels and tribulations of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the voice of Michael the archangel, the voice of Gabriel, who was Noah, and Raphael, and of divers angels from Michael or Adam down to the present time, all declaring their dispensations their rights, their keys, their honor, their majesty and glory, and the power of their priesthood. As President John Taylor spoke of it, he says this, that although the Church was so few in numbers, the principles and purposes of God were developed fully to the vision of Joseph Smith's mind, and he gazed upon the things that are to transpire in the last days associated with the dispensation that he was called upon by the Almighty to introduce. He learned by communication from the heavens from time to time of the great events that should transpire in the latter days. He understood things that were past and comprehended the various dispensations and the designs of those dispensations. He not only had the principles developed, but he was conversant with the parties who officiated as the leading men of those dispensations, and from a number of them he received authority and keys and priesthood and power for the carrying out of the great purposes of the Lord in the last days. Now, John Taylor lists the following, with whom the prophet was intimately acquainted. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Adam, Seth, Enoch, Jesus, the Father, the Nephite Apostles, and the Asiatic Apostles. The prophet, if you, wanted to, if you wanted him to describe Adam, he would do so, and did at the time. Some people get the idea that Adam was some kind of half-baboon or half-monkey or some kind of personality, but Adam had a perfect physique 
with power physically enough to live a thousand years, almost. And that's more than any of us here have. I mean, uh, he could outrun anyone here when he was uh, 600 years old. And uh, as the prophet talks about him, he says after the fall, when he went out hunting, he didn't worry about using the weapon, he just ran him down. And on another occasion, he talks about Adam. He says he was a very handsome man and a man of great strength. On one occasion, a good sister up in New York had been converted to the gospel, and during her work about the house, a glorious vision opened to her, and she saw a personage, a very glorious personage. She describes him, but she felt that maybe for the sake of not being deceived, she shouldn't tell anyone. So she told her husband, that was about as far as it went. One day the prophet Joseph happened to be passing through on his way back east, and he stopped over and stayed overnight with him. And as they conversed in the evening, this good sister took the opportunity to relate her vision to him and says, Now, Brother Joseph, I don't want to be deceived, but what do you think about it? Well, the prophet informed her that she had a true vision, and it was from the Lord, and that the person she saw was Adam. He says he had seen the same angel several times. It was Michael, the archangel, who was revealed to her. He had seen him several times. He was that kind of person. We think of Peter, James, and John coming to restore the priesthood back in the wilderness between Harmony and Colesville, but they were on the scene more often than that. In Missouri, the prophet comments to the brethren one time. He says, I was talking to the apostle Peter the other day, and this is what he told me. And here men like Heber C. Kimball speak, uh, they tell you that Peter and John were at least in the temple for an hour and a half on occasion, the Kirtland Temple. And the prophet sits down and has an hour and a half conversation with John the Revelator. Now, it's that kind of experience that you've got to see if you're going to understand Joseph Smith. He lived and breathed this kind of thing to such extent that, as, as William uh, Taylor says, he was as familiar over there as he was here. And you have a kind of hard time distinguishing where the veil fits in between when you have a person like that. And under those circumstances, then, he was taught and he was instructed, and this not only by ministry but by visual means. And it's on this basis, then, that much that we have that we call the gospel is given. For example, we talk about the three degrees of glory, Revelation. If you read section 76, the prophet tells you that he and Sidney Rigdon were working on the inspired revision of the Bible. And as they came to a certain passage in the fifth chapter of John, it was given to them differently than as it's recorded in the King James Version. And as it was given to them, then they marveled, and as they marveled, then the glory of the Lord rested upon them, and then the vision was opened, and they saw then the future destiny of the human family. Now, there was about a dozen people in the room at the time, or at least before the whole thing was over with. And one of these men was a good brother by the name of Philo Dibble, and he gives us this account. He says, Joseph would at intervals say, What do I see? As one might say while looking out of the window and beholding that to what all in the room could not see. Then he would relate what he had seen or what he was looking at. Then Sidney would reply, I can see the same thing, and would repeat what he had seen or was seeing. And Joseph would reply, I can see the same thing. This manner of conversation, as the devil says, was repeated at short intervals to the end of the vision, and during the whole time not a word was spoken by any other person. Not a sound nor motion was made by anyone but Joseph and Sidney. And it seemed to me that they never moved a joint or limb during the time I was there, which was, uh, uh, I think, over an hour to the end of the vision. He came in a little bit late. Joseph sat firmly and calmly all the time in the midst of a magnificent glory, but Sidney sat limp and pale, apparently as limber as a dish rag. Observing which, Joseph remarked smilingly, Brother Sidney isn't used to this like I am. Oh, now, it's under those kinds of circumstances, then, that we not only get the three degrees of glory vision, and what we have in section 76 is only a, a small fraction of what Joseph Smith received. Here in the teachings of the prophet, the Joseph Smith makes this observation. He says, I could explain a hundred times more than I ever have of the glories that the king has manifested to me in the vision were I permitted and were the people prepared to receive them. I could just give you a hundred times more than what's in section 76. 
Now, it's this kind of thing that we need to see in order to appreciate Joseph Smith. There's one account where he says something like this. After I got through translating the Book of Mormon, I took the Urim and Thummim and read the Bible. Now, let me just stop there for a minute. The Urim and Thummim operates on a visual principle. When Abraham had the Urim and Thummim, if you read Abraham chapter 3, he says, Now Abraham had the Urim and Thummim which the Lord my God had given me of Ur of the Chaldees. And he says, And I saw the stars that they were great and that there was one of them nearest to the throne of God. And there were many great ones which were near unto it. And then he records his great vision of fellow heavens to which we belong with Kolob as the great governing orb of this galaxy. All right, now the Urim and Thummim operates on a visual principle. One of the things that Moroni taught the prophet when he was sitting on the hill with him during those four years was how to use the Urim and Thummim. And when he finally got the plates, he was far more fascinated with the Urim and Thummim than he was with the plates themselves. He went there initially, as I've said, with dollar signs in his eyes. But when he finally got them, he was far more interested in the plates, when in the Urim and Thummim rather than the plates, because he says, I can look in this thing and see anything that I want to see. All right, now, when the prophet completed the translation of the Book of Mormon, then he says, I took the Urim and Thummim and I read the Bible. I read the Book of Genesis. And I saw the things that are recorded therein. Now you think for a minute what that includes. That's the creation, the garden, the fall, the antediluvian period, the flood, put on down through to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so forth. And then he says, I read the book of Exodus, and I saw the things that are recorded there. Now that's the great Exodus from Israel. That's better, I'm sure, than what Cecil B. DeMille did. And then he says, I so continued from one book to another until I had read the whole of it. He says, the whole Bible passed before me like a great panorama. And then he kind of mused about the sectarian ministers who were bombarding him, old ignoramus Joe Smith, you know. He says, well, I have forgotten a thousand times more about the Bible than they ever knew. Now, when the prophet translated the Book of Mormon, then he translated not just as a bright intellect, he translated as a seer. He translated by a visual means. For example, here in the eighth chapter of the book of Mosiah, you have an account where the Nephites wanted to know about the Jaredite records. And Ammon had a little insight to help the Nephite king. And he says, uh, Ammon said, I can surely tell the O king of a man that can translate the records. For he has wherewith that he can look and translate all records that are of an ancient day. It's a visual process. He has wherewith he can look. He says, And it is a gift from God, and the things are called interpreters. And no man can look in them except he be commanded, lest he should look, for that he ought not, and that he should perish. And whoso is commanded to look in them, the same is called seer, the root word being see. Now, when Joseph Smith translated, then he translated as a seer. Here, for example, in section 3 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord is making reference to the lost book of Lehi, this 116-page manuscript that Oliver, uh, that rather Martin Harris lost. He makes this statement here in verse 12 of section 3. He says, When thou deliverest up that which God had given thee sight and power to translate. Now, how, what did he give Joseph to translate? He gave him sight and power to translate. He says, Thou deliverest up that which that was sacred into the hands of wicked men. And so the prophet then translated as a seer through visual means. And then when it came then to organizing the church, he didn't just sit down and figure out how to be organized. He was shown the organization of the church in vision. If you read section 107, where it talks about the 70s, it says that, that it's according to the vision that the 70s should be organized. And then he goes on to explain the organization that he had seen in vision. Now, similarly then, when the prophet finally rolled the keys that came off under the twelve. In the spring of 1844, he did so with his comment. He says, I have now finished the work which was laid upon me by committing to you all things for the building up of the kingdom according to the heavenly vision and the pattern shown to me from heaven. Uh, in that sense, then, much that we have doesn't come just because Joseph Smith prayed and received a revelation. It came because of the principle of vision, revelation, opening to view the... the uh, 
scenes of the last days and the scenes of the organization of the church and the scenes of doctrine to the prophet. And this was true, for example, of the, of, of the, of the temples. Uh, the prophet not, never just sat down and got himself an architect. He says, Lord, what do you want to, what do you want to build? And the Lord showed it to him. Now, for example, when it comes to the Nauvoo temple, the temple was under construction at the time that Josiah Quincy and his distinguished friend Charles Francis Adams visited Nauvoo just before the martyrdom. And so the prophet took them around the city, and among other things, he took them to, uh, to the uh, temple site, and as they were there, the workmen were working on the temple, and one of them was working on one of these huge face stones that set up at the top of the pillars, if you vision your mind of the Nauvoo temple. And this good brother asked the prophet, he says, Brother Joseph, is this face exactly like the one that you saw in vision? Well, the prophet sits back and looks at it and studies it over. He just look at it and he says, uh, very near it, he says, except, he says, except the nose is just a thought too broad. And then Josiah Quincy makes his comment. He says, being presumably like something Smith had seen in vision, it cannot be compared to any ecclesiastical building which may be discerned by the natural eyesight. Now, during the course of that building, the prophet did hire an architect to translate his vision to architectural design. And this good brother, by the name of Weeks, came in one day and he says, Joseph, this thing just isn't conventional. It just defies everything in regard to architectural design. And he went on and says, now I suggest you do this and this and this. Well, the prophet listened to him very carefully. And when he got through, Joseph made this comment. He says, I wish you to carry out my designs. I have seen in vision the splendid appearance of that building illuminated and will have it built according to the pattern shown to me. Now, when you enjoy the blessings of the gospel, my brothers and sisters, think where they came from. They came from a latter-day seer. They came from a man, for example, who could say and did say this, Paul has seen the third heavens and I more. And he came from a man who wrote to a prominent American and said, I have witnessed the visions of eternity and beheld the glorious mansions of bliss and the regions of the misery of the damned. I have heard the voice of God and communed with angels and spoke as moved upon by the Holy Ghost for the renewal of the everlasting covenant for the gathering of Israel in the last days. A man also could say, It is my meditation all the day and more than my meat and drink to know how I shall make the saints of God comprehend the visions that roll like an overflowing surge before my mind. And then as he gave that greatest of all recorded discourses, and I underscore the word recorded, the King followed address, he concluded with this statement. He says, You don't know me. You never knew my heart. No man knows my history. I cannot tell it. I shall never undertake it. I don't blame anyone for not believing my history. If I, hadn't, if I had not experienced what I have, I could not believe it myself. Now, on that basis, then, as we talk about the prophet and evaluate him, let me just give you one or two statements here in conclusion. I'm going to put away most of my the rest of my notes and, and come down to a comment or two that may be helpful in the conclusion here of my remarks. Here's Wilford Woodruff. There is not so great a man as Joseph standing in this generation. The Gentiles look upon him, and he's like a bed of gold concealed from human view. They know not his principles, his spirit, his wisdom, his virtue, his philanthropy, nor his calling. His mind, like Enoch's, expands as eternity, and only God can comprehend his soul. And then there's the New York Sun paper in that day. This Joseph Smith must be set down as an extraordinary character, a prophet hero, as Carlyle might call him. He is one of the greatest men of the age, and in future will rank with those who, in one way or another, have stamped his impression strongly upon society. And there's John Greenleaf Whittier, poet. Once in the world's history we have had a Yankee prophet, and we have had him in Joe Smith, for good or for evil. He has left his track on the great pathway of life, or, to use the words of Horn, knocked out for himself a window in the wall of the 19th century 
whence his ruddy, bold, good-humored face will peer out upon the generations to come. I studied my whole life about the prophet Joel, academically and by personal interest. I can safely say that if you were to search out and find one man and one man only where the appellation of prophet, seer, and revelator can appropriately be used above all other individuals who have held the prophetic calling from Adam to the present, with the exception of Jesus alone, that one man would be Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet. He was a greater lawgiver than was Moses. He was a greater seer than was Samuel. And uh, in modern times, he had a more phenomenal rise from more humble circumstances than Abraham Lincoln. He knew more theology hands down than Jonathan Edwards, and he, and not Emerson, is our greatest and wisest American. I bear you my testimony. He was everything that he claimed to be, a prophet of God, a revelator, a seer, and that the great vision which he was given, opening the Lord's purposes for the future, is still in process. In fact, the biggest part of it is still yet to be done. And there are things to transpire in the not very far distant future which will be the major events of this dispensation will overshadow everything that's happened so far with the exception of those great founding experiences that Joseph Smith had himself, the first vision, Moroni and others. And you people are living on the threshold of that day and age. May the Lord bless you to catch the vision of the prophet's work and to do that which you have been foreordained and appointed to do, to bring it about. It is my humble prayer in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen.